So welcome everybody and uh, thank you very much Ipe. We're very pleased that the college has provided support for us to uh, have the company of Takeo Hoshi with us, who for any of you who have studied the Japanese economy, you will know is a very big name in that field. And uh, so it's a great pleasure for us. He is also somebody who knows the ANU well. He's been here on several occasions, but particularly going back a long way. So he came here as a young man. <laughs> we, won't, we won't speculate on when exactly that was. <laughs> Let me tell you a bit about him. Um, so Takeo is now the uh, Henry and Tomoe Takahashi Senior Fellow in Japanese Studies at Stanford University, which is basically an endowed chair in Japanese Studies at Stanford University, where he will now be heading the Japan Japanese Studies Center. And that follows in a very distinguished line of people who've run that center before, Dan Okimoto and uh, Aoki Sensei. So um, Takeo describes his mission as trying to resurrect Japanese studies at Stanford, where like <coughs> here, it, we, has, it has been a little bit eclipsed by Chinese and other uh, very important subjects, but, but those of us with Japan dear to our hearts are delighted to see him. Um, joining this mission. Um, Takeo's background is uh, he was an undergraduate at uh, Tokyo University and then followed that with a PhD in economics from MIT and um, has a number of distinguished associations to his name. Um, he's been visiting uh, scholar at many, many institutions, uh, the Bank of Japan, the University of Tokyo, the IMF and then uh, took a position almost immediately from his PhD at the University of California, San Diego, where he has been um, a professor for, I think I overheard you saying, how many years? 24 years. So I expect that there's a certain amount of tearfulness and gnashing of teeth at San Diego to lose him to Stanford, but I guess they're not very far apart, are they? Um, Takeo's research has um, spanned a number of, of areas, but he's particularly well known for his work on finance and governance, corporate governance in Japan, and has a number of really important books, which any of you who've taken any courses from me will, of course, have read. So um, the book, joint book with Anil Kashap, Corporate Finance and Governance in Japan, The Road to the Future, that was an optimistic title, um, but is a, is a fabulous study of the nature of Japan's uh, corporate financial system. And it came out in uh, Japanese, translated by the, uh, the Nikkei in 2006. Um, and he co-edited another great collection of, of essays on the Japanese financial system with Hugh Patrick, Crisis and Change in the Japanese Financial System. And of course, as any good academic, he has a long string of distinguished articles to his name in, in many of the learned journals. Um, and he tells me that he has just had a book out in Japanese, which gr grows out of the same research project that tonight's lecture is, is uh, coming from. Um, finally, um, I should mention some of the honors and awards that, um, that Takeo has been given because uh, there are two particularly important ones uh, from Japan which are awarded to rising, I think they describe it as rising academics, though many of us regard Takeo as having risen. But uh, the Nakahara Prize, which he won in 2005, which is the prize given by the um, Economics Society, Japanese Economics Society, and the Enjoji Jiro Memorial Prize, which is awarded by the Nikkei, which he won in 2006. So although he has been in the United States for his entire academic career, his work is very well known and well regarded in Japan too. So we're delighted to have him talk tonight about why did Japan stop growing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny, for a very kind introduction. And as Jenny mentioned, I was at UC San Diego for 24 years. 
And I think uh, I first met Jenny when I was there during my either first year or second year. There you visited uh, the UC San Diego, so it's, uh, and uh, I, I've known her ever since. So it's nice to uh, come back here at ANU and see my old friends, uh, Jenny and Peter and others, and uh, talk about the Japanese economy, which has been the subject of my research in the last uh, 25 years or so, probably uh, longer now. Okay. And uh, today's talk is titled, Why Did Japan Stop Growing? And uh, this is based on the two reports I did with my long, long time co-author, Anil Kashap, uh, for a National uh, Institute of, for Research Advancement. It's a think tank in Japan uh, called NIRA. And we did a report on why did Japan stop growing uh, a couple of years ago, the January 2011. And then followed that up with another report, which talks about what Japan can do to restore the growth. And we titled that Policy Options for Japan's Revival. And that's, uh, that, that's a report we published in June of 2012. And the both reports are available at NIRA website. So if you are interested in these topics after my lecture, uh, you can go there and uh, look at those those papers. And uh, those papers uh, translated into Japanese and updated with a little update, and probably more importantly, with a forward from uh, Motoshige Ito, uh, a very famous economist uh, in Japan. And also, he, he has been involved in the policy making in Japan. And he's a president, uh, no, no, chair, chairman or president of NIRA. And he uh, writes. He, he wrote, uh, kindly wrote a forward for a book, and that has been published by Nikkei uh, this year, in January of this year. And I've heard the book is selling pretty well, uh, more than we expected, but I didn't see that in any bookstore when, when I visited there last week or two weeks ago, <laughs> and Jenny didn't see that too. So, so I'm, I'm wondering where the, the, those people who are buying these, this book uh, it's, it's actually selling quite well. The, the number is there. The more, it, it sold more than 4,000, which is more than twice as, as the, the expectation of mine. Okay. So the outline of the talk is um, I will give you a brief overview of the Japan's long-term growth and try to explain what happened to Japan. And especially what we are interested in, especially, is a why, as the title suggested, why Japan stopped growing and uh, stagnated for so long. So we try to identify bottlenecks that have impaired growth in Japan. And then we follow that up by talking about the, the policies, what the Jap something the Japanese government can do without costing very much, because as I will talk about, the Japanese government has a huge issue about the government debt. So we go over some options which can be, which could be implemented without much resources and helpful to revive the growth. Okay. And finally, at the end of the lecture, uh, assuming I have time, um, I will talk about Abenomics which some of you have heard uh, if you are following the Japanese economy. That's an economic policy pursued by the new government uh, led by Prime Minister Abe, who started in December of last year. And I will talk about my evaluation of Abenomics, or I will talk about what it is and uh, my evaluation of Abenomics so far. Okay. And how much time do I have? Yeah. Forty-five minutes. Forty-five minutes. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll talk for about forty-five minutes. So this is a GDP growth rate, real GDP growth rate for Japan from 1956 to 2000. And of course, uh, old people like us remember uh, Japan used to grow very rapidly in 50s and 60s. Okay. But we have some uh, young audience tonight or today. So I just wanted, want, want them to know that Japan actually used to grow quite rapidly. 
even though we haven't seen that in the last 20 years. Okay. So if you were born in 1950s or 1960s, you still remember the time Japan grew, grew very fast. And the uh, growth rate declined uh, a lot in the middle of the uh, 1970s, but throughout the 1970s, late 70s and 80s, Japan grew on average by 3.8% per year, which is a respectable rate. Okay, we talked about the growth slowdown, but the 3.8% uh, looks quite good from now. But after 1990, uh, Japanese economy basically stopped growing. The growth rate became, become, became very low, and this is a period many of you remember. Okay? And this continues into 2000. Okay? There are lots of lines in this figure, but uh, all of those look the same, and that's exactly the point. No matter where you measure the GDP growth, and it doesn't matter if you look at the GDP growth or GDP per capita growth, um, the experience of or performance of the Japanese economy in late 1990s and 2000 has been uh, dismal. Okay. And the reason I have uh, many lines in this figure is that there is a recent argument that says even though the Japanese economy looks stagnating, but if you look at the Japanese economy or the economic growth in Japan per working population, okay, that actually the, uh, Japan hasn't done that bad. Now, what happened to Japan is that the, because of the aging, the working population shrunk. So the economy shrunk. But if you divide the economy by the number of people in the working, num number of people who are working, the Japanese economy didn't do that bad. So for example, Paul Krugman has been writing this. But the problem of this argument is that people use the number of people uh, who are older than 15 years old and younger than 65 years old as a definition of working population. So if you take that number, and calculate the GDP growth rate per working population, then uh, the Japanese uh, growth rate looks better than actual number in some years. Okay. But the problem is the working population is different from the people, Japanese people who are actually working or who are willing to work. Okay. So instead of working population, if you take the labor force, and consider the growth rate of GDP per labor force, then the picture you get is pretty much exactly the same as uh, real GDP growth itself or GDP per capita growth. So what's, what's happening here is that what happened in Japan is that people aged. So the working population, uh, the, the, the working population shrunk, but the many people older than 65 years old uh, continue to work. Okay. So the, it's misleading to divide the GDP by working population because now uh, more people are working in Japan. So J what, what's happening in Japan is really the stagnation of the growth. And we don't see the remarkable uh, productivity growth that uh, uh, people like uh, Paul Krugman pointed out. So um, we start by looking at the Japanese experience using a standard economics. And my claim is that standard economics goes a long way in explaining what happened in Japan. Okay? But we need to also add the conditions that the Japan or, or the environment Japan faced, which made the Japanese growth problem more serious than some other countries. So the, the, this is a standard production function uh, that we use in economic growth theory, the Cobb Douglas, or we, we can have a neoclassical uh, production function. And if you assume the output of the economy is produced by these factors, uh, capital, labor, and the level of technology, then uh, you can express the growth rate of the economy in terms of the contribution of capital, the growth of capital, and the growth of labor, and the technological progress. 
and writing everything in terms of per capita or per worker term, you can get the increase in GDP per capita or GDP per worker depends on two factors. One is the accumulation of capital, the capital per worker, and the other part is the technological progress. And what we know from the empirical data from many countries is that uh, this explains the actual experience of growth uh, very well. And in most countries, especially advanced countries, the growth comes from the technological progress, productivity growth, which is this term. Okay. In a catch-up economy, like what Japan was in 50s and 60s, when uh, Japan, the, the level of output was in Japan was lower, much lower, compared with more advanced uh, economies like the US, they were able to grow fast by accumulating the factors, the capital, and importing technology from more advanced economies, or uh, imitating the technology or sometimes stealing technologies, <laughs> which was easier back then, I guess. But after you catch up with more advanced economies, uh, in order to continue to grow, you need to innovate. That you need to increase the technological progress. Okay? And uh, so that suggests, as, as I will argue later, that Japan had trouble innovating itself or increasing the productivity, especially in 1990s and 2000s. And uh, this is a one way to look at uh, uh, so, let's see. so another thing I should say is, as I said, uh, in a catch-up catch economy, the high growth is much easier because they can just import the, the technology from the, uh, from the more advanced economies, and they can just accumulate the, uh, the productive resources, like a capital. But as you get closer to the advanced economies, um, it becomes harder to grow. So what it implies is that if you compare a large economy, which is close to the frontier of, of the today's technology and the small economy, which is uh, very far from the advanced economies, the smaller economies tend to grow faster than the large economies. And eventually, the smaller economies will become bigger faster than the big economies. So the size of the economies uh, of all the countries uh, tend to be equal. And this is called convergence in the growth literature. And the one implication of a simple neoclassical growth model is a convergence. As the economy's output grows, as the economy grows, the growth rate slows down. Okay. And this is one way to see the convergence. Okay. So this shows the GDP per capita for the G7 countries from 1970 to 2009. Okay, it's not exactly right. The GDP doesn't look this smooth. Okay, it moves around. So what we did here was to extract the trend, the long-term trend of GDP from an actual GDP series. Okay, and uh, uh, the, what, for for those of you who know the economics or who are technical. Uh, we applied a uh, Hardwick Prescott filter of a very large smoothing parameter of 400. Okay. So, so, so that to get a very smooth trend. Okay. And red is Japan, and uh, you, you can see the other countries uh, according to their, their colors here. And the message of this uh, graph is that if you compare Japan to other economies, the Japan's growth path has a bigger curvature, okay. which means because the growth rate is a slope of this, <coughs> the Japanese growth 
slows down, slowed down uh, more rapidly compared with the other countries. Okay. Now, this is a hard graph to look at, I understand. So I, we came up with another way to look at the same data, okay. which is a little bit easier once you understand uh, what we are doing here. So what we are doing here is we take the trend GDP per capita that we calculated. This is a smooth series. Okay. And measure the trend growth rate, uh, so sorry, the, the level of the trend GDP per capita on horizontal axis. And at each point of um, GDP per capita, trend GDP per capita, we calculate the growth rate of the trend. Okay, so this is the slope of that the audio picture, and measure that on the vertical axis. So this shows at each point of the GDP per capita, what was the trend GDP growth rate? So at $20,000 per capita GDP, if you read, say, a red line, uh, trend growth rate for Japan was 3.5%. As the Japanese uh, trend GDP increased to about $25,000 per capita, the GDP growth rate, the trend growth rate for Japan, declined to be less than 2%. Okay. So the, what the convergence implies is the slope of this uh, curve will be negative for, for, for all the countries. And that's pretty much what we see here, okay? So we can see the evidence of the convergence. So one answer to the question why Japan stopped growing or why the growth rate of Japan declined is a convergence, which is a natural phenomenon that we expect from a standard economic theory. Okay. But the convergence is not the whole story because there are some countries which continue to grow, which seem to continue to grow even at high level of GDP per capita, like over $30,000. Okay. Those are Canada, US, and uh, uh, UK. Okay. Um, I thought about adding Australia to this figure, uh, but I didn't have an access to uh, EVU's program this morning, so I couldn't do that. But uh, what, what I, little I know about Australia tells me that Australia is actually uh, closer to uh, Canada, UK, and US. Even at the relatively high level of GDP per capita, Australia has been growing at higher rate than other countries, right? like European countries or Japan. Okay? So there seems to be a difference uh, among these, these uh, G7 countries. And we can identify three groups here. The one is a group I just talked about, the US, Canada, uh, and the UK, which seem to continue to grow even at a high level of the per GDP per capita. And then France and Germany, uh, which seems to be converging to a lower trend growth, growth rate. And then there's Italy, which uh, continues to decline and will go negative. Actually, we stopped at 2009, so they, they are probably in the negative region now. Uh, Japan was following the path of Italy until recently, okay. until around, so this point is around 2000. Okay. And uh, following the trend of Italy is not good from an economic point of view. <laughs> Well, if you're talking about soccer, that may be a different story. Okay. And, uh, but uh, from an economic point of view, it's not good. And it seems Japan was succeeded in breaking away from Italy and uh, look more like uh, France and Germany. But a question we want to ask is, uh, even though the convergence explains probably a lot of uh, uh, growth slowdown for Japan. 
there's, there are some countries like uh, US and Canada which continue to grow even at high level of per capita GDP. So um, I don't think there's no reason Japan cannot do that. And uh, why Japan didn't do that is a question. So summarizing what we can learn from this uh, graph, so there's a convergence. So the dramatic slowdown of uh, Japanese growth rate uh, can be explained partially by a convergence. But the Japanese slowdown was uh, much faster than other countries. And the Japan reached a much, seems to have reached much lower trend growth rate, growth rate much earlier than the other countries like US, Canada, and the UK. So what was different for Japan compared with these countries? And we identify in, in our report three factors. The one is uh, aging. Aging proceeded more rapidly in Japan, and aging is not good for economic growth, as I explain in a minute. The second one we point out is Japan uh, depended a lot on export for its growth and continue to depend on export. And that creates a problem when there is a lots of fluctuation in exchange rate and, uh, and uh, there are lots of shocks in the global economy and uh, depend, too much dependence on export makes a country vulnerable to these shocks in the global economy. So there was a problem of export-led growth strategy that the Japan pursued during the rapid economic growth period and continue to pursue uh, even today. In addition to these uh, conditions that Japan faced, okay. I, I think there are several economic policy mistakes that the Japanese government made in the last 20 years. Okay. And the first policy mistake we point out is uh, the Japanese government allowed the what we call zombie firms to continue to exist in the economy and that tend to slow down the productivity growth. And I will talk more about the zombie firms later, but uh, for those of you who are fan, fan of a, a horror movie, the, you, you have seen zombies, right? Those are the living dead uh, coming back and attack the other human beings and uh, turns them into zombies. And exactly the same thing happens in the, in, in the, in the economy. Okay, that, so that's one thing I will talk about. The second policy mistake we will point out is Japan was slow in deregulate, deregulating in many industries, especially compared with these three countries which continue to grow even at high level of output high level of GDP per capita, US, UK, and Canada, all of those experienced uh, uh, the large-scale deregulation at one point, and which restored the growth. Uh, Japan uh, hasn't done that. And finally, there are some macroeconomic policy mistakes that I will talk about. And there is some interesting thing about the 2000 uh, stop or to 2000 of uh, recovery, but I don't think I have time to uh, talk about that today. Okay. So aging, okay. aging is not good for the economy. Okay. There, there may be some benefit of aging, which I started to feel these days, but uh, from <laughs> overall economic point of view, uh, aging has a cost. And in order to see that uh, mathematically, okay, you can consider uh, what is the growth rate of uh, GDP per capita, y divided by n population. And y divided by n is a y divided L labor force times labor force divided by n. Okay. So the uh, the ratio of the labor force to population matters for the GDP growth, GDP per capita growth. Okay. If more people are working 
that helps. More, more, a larger proportion of the population is working, that helps economic growth. What aging does is eventually people retire and the drop out of labor force. And they don't continue to contribute to the production. So from economic growth point of view, aging is not uh, good. Uh, aging is uh, detrimental to growth. And also, the, if, you, or if you think about the quality of labor, productivity of the labor, um, there are some evidence that shows the rate of quality improvement uh, becomes lower as you get older. If you, if you passed 45, that's an estimate I get from uh, one sample uh, econometric study using my personal experience. Okay. And uh, I, I think it's true. So, so the a aging is not a good, good thing for the growth. And if you compare Japan to other countries, Japan has been growing or aging very rapidly. So this shows the proportion of the old people. Uh, the definition of the old people here is a six, 65 years old and above okay. in, ter in percentage term from 1960 to 2050. Okay, so uh, from some, some point, this becomes a projection. Okay. And Japan is on the top. So the aging has been happening, happening very quickly. Okay, so back in uh, 1960s, the Japan was a very young country, okay. actually younger than Australia okay. in terms of the population structure. Now Japan is the oldest in terms of the proportion of the old people. And Australia and the US are still young countries. There, there are many young people in the economy, which is a good news. But Japan faces a serious aging problem. Okay. And just to see uh, what we should expect to happen to Japan, the Japanese uh, uh, stru population structure. Okay. So this is a population pyramid I took from a uh, uh, website of the Japanese uh, National Institute of the Population. Um, and this was a population structure in 1960s. And these are the number of males in for, for each uh, cohort and age bracket, and this is the number of uh, female. And uh, this, become, this became like this in 1980. So there's a baby boomer in here, and there was a second baby boomer. 2000, third baby boomer didn't happen, or hasn't, hadn't happened, and didn't happen. This, this is what uh, they expect to happen in 2020 and 2040. Okay, more, mostly old people. So Japan faces a serious uh, aging challenge. Okay. And so far, uh, the Japanese government or Japan hasn't responded to this aging problem uh, in an in a effective way. Okay. The second, second challenge that Japan had was Japan depended a lot on growth, a lot on export for growth. So the Japanese model was uh, Japan uh, imports the res natural resources, manufactures those, and sell to the world market. And the Japan came to have uh, world-class manufacturing companies who, who succeeded, which succeeded a lot in the global market. But the problem of the export-led growth is it, it worked, in a sense, for Japan because the, when the Japanese economy was growing, the world economy was under the fixed exchange rate regime called Bretton Woods. And may, as many people argue, the Japanese uh, exchange rate was somewhat undervalued. But as we know from international economics, um, when the productivity of the export industry grows fast, uh, as it happens in the successful exporting economies like Japan, the, it eventually uh, appreciates the real exchange rate and the uh, country starts to lose the competitiveness in some industries. So it's called balasa samuelson effect. And more importantly, if the country con tr con tries to continue to depend on export for growth, 
it leaves the country vulnerable to external shocks. And there are lots of uncertainties these days, or shocks these days in the world economy. And also, it can distort the resource allocations. If you subsidize exporters, uh, then um, by, say, uh, continued undervalued exchange rate, that can lead to uh, excess capital accumulation in some industries. So that may not achieve uh, balanced growth. So this is a one way to attempt, well, one attempt to show that the uh, Japanese economy, even today, depends a lot on the export for its growth compared with other countries. So on the, uh, this column, on the farthest left column, I show the average share of exports in GDP from 1995 to 2008. So, so this is the uh, importance of exporting level. Okay. And one thing you can see quickly is that in, according to this measure of export, so, so this is a measure of openness of a country. Japan is pretty much a closed economy, like the US. Large domestic market and small uh, export. Okay. The, so mostly the Japanese, Japanese economy, is, the most, the, most of the Japanese economy comes from the domestic demand. Okay. But if you look at the contribution of export growth to GDP growth, so if you just look at the GDP growth and ask the question, how much of the GDP growth comes from the export, export growth? Okay. Japan uh, depends on export in a big way. So actually, the export growth explains 440% of GDP growth. So that means the rest is actually shrinking. So Japan depended, depends a lot on growth. So if you look at other countries, the, in most of the countries, the average share of the export is, or the contribution of export growth to GDP growth is pretty similar to average share of exports. So the both exports and uh, domestic market are growing at the same rate. There are two exceptions, uh, Japan and Germany. Okay, so these are two export-oriented economies. And even compared with Germany, okay. the discrepancy between the dependence on exporting level and dependence on exporting growth is large for Japan, or huge for Japan. So Japan, uh, seems to uh, depend on export too much. So can I ask you yes. Why do you compare the exports, maybe the most severe, if the export is increasing at the same amount, import is increasing. Yeah. Uh, that's not the uh, fair evaluation. So if it's a net export, I don't think uh, you have the figure for net exports or something. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a figure I prepared for you. Right. And the same thing. Okay. It's an external demand contribution to external demand. So those are the challenges uh, Japan faced. Uh, the export-led growth worked very well in the rapid, growth, the rapid economic growth period, 50s and 60s, when the world was under the Bretton Woods system. The world changed. Uh, Japan probably wanted to have changed, but uh, they didn't. Okay. Uh, aging was another issue, the challenge Japan faced, but the Japan uh, so far failed to respond to that challenge effectively. Okay. Now, in addition to those, uh, th th there are um, some, some other problems uh, or other mistakes the Japanese government made. And one is the, they put too much effort on prote in protecting zombies. And this was especially clear in the aftermath of the banking crisis, or, or, or the aftermath of the collapse of the bubbles and uh, increasing in non-performing loans and the banking crisis. So, so I'm talking about uh, what happened in 1990s. And uh, undercapitalized banks uh, in late 1990s was hesitant to recognize losses by writing off the non-performing loans, but instead 
rollover loans to protect the weak firms. And this is something the government implicitly encouraged, and also the, the bank regulator allowed the Japanese banks to continue doing this. And um, the problem of uh, protecting the weak firms is not only that the bank's resources, the financial or the fund or money, is used to protect those companies which would go out of business if there is a natural competition, but the more important cost of protecting weak firms is this will, um, th this will impose harms on other firms, otherwise healthy firms, or potential new entrants, which presumably have a higher productivity. Okay. Because the many resources are already tied up in the zombie companies, and as a new company or as an expanding company, you have to compete with zombies for those resources. Okay. And you can consider the resource as like a fund, financial market competition, or demand for the product. And probably the more important, most important thing is the human capital. Okay. So one problem, or the important problem of protecting zombies is uh, precious human capitals are, in a sense, trapped in those zombie companies. And the expanding companies or uh, new companies cannot get or ha have a hard, hard time getting those human capitals. So existence of the zombie firms or continuance of the zombie firms uh, reduces the profitability for expanding firms or more productive firms. And the overall, the mechanism of creative destruction uh, is suppressed. And many recent research shows the creative destruction, the, the companies with low productivity and low profitability go out of business and they are replaced by a more productive, more profitable companies. This type of creative destruction is an important part of productivity growth in many countries, in many industries. And that important channel for productivity growth is, uh, is not, was not working very well for the Japanese economy because of the protection of the zombie farms. And that, uh, this, this is a figure from uh, my paper with Daniel Kashap and also Ricardo Caballero on zombie farms in Japan. And this shows on the horizontal axis the changes in the zombie index we create. And the zombie index is an estimate of how much of the industry is occupied by zombies. Okay. I don't get into the details. The changes in that index from 80s to 90s. And, com and uh, on the vertical axis, we plot the TFP growth rate, the total factor productivity growth rate of that industry from 1990 to 2000. And we can see a uh, rough uh, negative relation between, at the industry level, between the change in the zombie index and the TFP growth rate, which suggests in an industry where we started to absorb more zombies in 1990s, productivity growth was lower. So the zombie seems to hurt productivity growth. And another thing we find when we calculate the zombie index for each industry, we find the zombie, was, uh, zombie phenomena was more serious in non-manufacturing industries compared with manufacturing industries. So if we compare the manufacturing and non-manufacturing, their productivity level, okay, from 1980 to 2006, and this is normalized to be 100 in 1995, uh, you can see the productivity growth for uh, uh, manufac both manufacturing and non-manufacturing up to early 1990s. Okay. Manufacturing is blue, and the non-manufacturing is red. After that, there are there some cyclical movement, but for manufacturing, the uh, total factor productivity continued to grow, even though the pace was slower. For non-manufacturing, the productivity growth didn't really happen in, uh, in the, in the uh, 15 years from 1990 to 2006. 
So the level of productivity at 2006 was pretty much the same as the level of productivity back in early 1990s. So especially for non-manufacturing, the where the zero, zero lots of zombies, uh, the productivity growth uh, was slow or didn't exist. Now the second problem, second policy mistake Japan made was a lack of deregulation. And the most important regulation was the regulation to protect the incumbent in that industry by restricting the entry. And also uh, restricting exit is, is uh, related more to zombies. So by restricting the entries, the regulation raises profits for the incumbent firms, but reduces efficiency because it prevents the more productive firms to enter the market. Or if there is a regulation, the entry regulation, uh, in order to enter the market, um, the new firms has to have a very high productivities to over, overcome the handicap. So this is a, so, so we, we should see the similarity to the zombie problems. But because of the regulation, the process of creative destruction didn't happen. And that was uh, the second policy mistake we can identify for Japan. Okay. Um, this is a um, uh, regulation index. So this is an attempt to get to the question, how much regulation is there in industry? And this is a measure created by cabinet office by looking at the regulation or the restriction on permits and so on each year and see what happens in the next year. And we uh, divide the industries into two parts, manufacturing and non-manufacturing. And what we can see is the deregulation happened. So, so this is a regulation in index. So the decline of this index shows some kind of deregulation. Deregulation happened in both industries, but uh, manufacturing, it went smooth, but for non-manufacturing, it basically stopped after 2000. Okay. Now, how am I doing in terms of time? Do I, do I have like a tw 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 20 minutes? 20 minutes? Let me go faster a little bit. And so, so you, you can see the deregulation, even though it started in uh, mid-1990s, uh, the then the Prime Minister, uh, Ryutaro Hashimoto, was very big on deregulation. And he started some, but it slowed down substantially later, especially for non-manufacturing. Okay. And uh, there, there are some uh, regression analysis we do to get to the question of the, the, the uh, relation between deregulation and productivity growth, uh, we don't have a reliable result. Okay. So there's a suggestive evidence that shows that there is a relation between deregulation and the productivity growth for non-manufacturing. Okay. But again, uh, this uh, regression line is not significant. So this, I don't put too much emphasis on these uh, empirical results. Okay. Now, finally, there are some macroeconomic policies, macroeconomic policy mistakes the Japanese government did. Okay. And the first one is the, it took Japan a long time to clean up the banking sector after the banking crisis. So the non-performing loans continue to exist in the banking sector and the banks continue to support the zombie farms. Okay. And the second, there were some mistakes in fiscal policy. Okay. And third, there was a problem in monetary policy. So in both areas, macroeconomic policy had a problem. Okay. And I skipped the first one because I already talked about the zombie problems. And let me start by talking about the fiscal policy. So fiscal policy was um, often inconsistent and uh, wasn't effective in increasing the demand uh, for the Japanese economy in many cases. And also, uh, there may have been some crowding out uh, com coming from the increased expenditure of, of the government. And this shows, this is a simple graph, 
uh, the government spending divided by GDP, and or this is the government spending, red. And the blue is the private investment. Okay. As the government spending increased as a proportion of GDP, the private sector investment declined and continued to decline. So in the early 1990s, even though there were fiscal stimulus that the Japanese government did in order to address the cyclical downturn, or what they thought to be cyclical downturn, uh, the result of that, the result of the increased government spending may have been just crowding out the private sector investment. Okay. Of course, it's hard to tell the causality here. Another interpretation of this is because the private sector didn't invest, the government had to spend. Okay. So it's, it's hard to tell. But I think there is, we, we started to see a more clear evidence of uh, uh, government spending crowding out the private investment uh, this year, the 2012 and 2013, when the Abe government uh, started to stimulate the economy by increasing the government spending. And the uh, current government is planning uh, lots of public works in all over Japan. And that seemed to be creating a huge demand for construction materials, the demand for the construction labor, who, which have been deployed in um, the areas affected by the earthquake and tsunami disaster in 2011, so Tohoku areas, where we have, we have been observing huge private sector demand for recovery. So there are some anecdotes that tell that, that says the recovery in investment or the recovery work um, cannot continue smoothly because now there is an expectation for bigger public works everywhere in Japan, and the materials go there, and uh, construction companies move back to their own location to uh, get uh, get the orders from the government. So um, I. I I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get a better evidence of a crowding out, which may be happening now. Okay. And even worse, the, when the public investment was made, uh, not only it may have crowded out the, the private, private sector investment, it was spent on the areas where it had a low productivity. Okay. And here, uh, I take uh, marginal productivity of public capital uh, estimated in, as of 1991, esti estimated by uh, two uh, very good economists on public finance in Japan, uh, Professor Takeru Doi and uh, Professor Toshihiro Ihori, both of whom are here. <laughs> okay. So uh, I trust their estimates fully. <laughs> okay. And plot the share of the public investment uh, from 1992 to 2003. So where the government put money? So the government put money in roads, harbors, and airports, which had, by 1991, the lowest marginal productivity, okay. and less for other stuff. Okay. So not only the government expenditure may have crowded out the private investment, the government uh, expenditure was used in, in, a, in the wrong sectors. Okay. Even worse, uh, sometimes uh, fiscal stimulus wasn't sufficient, and the government tightened the fiscal policy uh, when it shouldn't have. Okay. And the most popular um, fiscal policy mistake was what happened in 1997. So in 1996, the Japanese economy was growing okay. Actually, the growing growth rate was quite high. So the Japanese government believed this is a time to uh, consolidate the budget. You know, they, so they spent too much. And this is a time to tighten the budget. And that they did. They increased uh, tax, consumption tax, uh, phased out the income tax cut and uh, increased other, uh, the, the, the pay payment for uh, medical insurance. 
So the budget's deficit in 1997 was much lower than the 1996. Okay. Now, if this was a mistake or not ex ante, I think it's debatable. Okay. The 96 was a, a good year. So I can understand the government argument that it's, it, this is a time to tighten the budget. Okay. At least it makes more sense to me uh, than the decision of uh, many European countries to tighten the budget uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but exposed, this was a mistake. Okay. Exposed, the Japanese economy turned back into recession. And uh, many people wish that the uh, Japanese government continued to expand, at least in 1997. Okay. So the Jap Japanese government started to spend more and continued to spend as the economy continued to stagnate. And as the economy continued to stagnate, the tax revenue continued to stagnate. The result was uh, expanding budget deficit and increasing government debt. And this shows the net government debt uh, as a percentage of GDP for selected countries, OECD countries. And Japan has now the second highest net GDP, no, net government debt to GDP ratio, second only to Greece after a restatement of Greece. Okay. They used to have a lower figure, which turned out to be a lie. But, uh, so before the restatement, Japan was the highest. After the restatement, uh, assuming uh, Greece is honest now, uh, they are the top. But Japan is growing fast. And one, one thing I, well, I'll, I'll, I may come back to that later. Okay. Monetary policy. The Japanese monetary policy was, the interest rate was low. Uh, the interest rate reached zero in 1999. So Japan started the zero interest rate policy um, for, for the first time in uh, recent history in the advanced economies. Okay. But the problem is that they were often reluctant to continue the uh, very expansionary monetary policy at the zero interest rate. And uh, they often argued, the Bank of Japan governors often argued that the, even though Japan is in deflation, which is a phenomenon, the price level continues to fall, the monetary policy is not effective in curing the deflation. Okay. So the e zero interest rate, even, e even though we are setting the interest rate to zero, uh, we don't think it works. So that uh, there, there was, I think there was a communications, the mistake in communication strategy. And more important mistake uh, the Bank of Japan did is that in 2000, August 2000, and also the 2006, twice, okay, the, they stopped the zero interest rate policy and increased the interest rate a little bit. When the economy was still under deflation. Okay, so this, this is a hard figure to look at. Okay. But the uh, uh, red line shows the CPI inflation rate, core CPI inflation rate according to the Bank of Japan, which is a general price index, less fresh food, okay. and uh, measured on the net axis. And this red uh, red straight line is a zero. So anything uh, below this uh, straight line is, shows that the uh, inflation rate was negative or deflation. And the blue line shows the interest rate. Okay. So interest rate is measured on the right hand side. And for the most of the time, the inf in interest rate was zero or close to zero. Okay. But in 2000, the Bank of Japan decided to raise the interest rate when the economy was still experiencing deflation. And uh, also in 2006, they decided to stop the zero interest rate policy again when the inflation rate was still under 0%. So 
So this clearly sent the signal to the market that the Bank of Japan is willing to stop the zero interest rate policy as soon as they see the sign of inflation or the, the sign that the deflation may be stopping, even if everyone else don't see that. So too rapid premature tightening was a clear uh, policy mistake, both extend and exposed for the Bank of Japan. Okay? So, so this is my summary of my view of uh, what's wrong with the Japanese economy, or what's been wrong with the Japanese economy. What the government can do, what, what, what they can do to restore the growth. Okay. So that's the second report we did and the second part of the book. And I have uh, 10 minutes to go through this. No, no, no it's okay. It's, uh, five minutes or something. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> five minutes to go through this. So there, there are three things. <laughs> there, there, there are classified into three categories. One, fixed macroeconomic policies. So more expansionary monetary policy using some non-traditional monetary policy and most importantly, communicating the Bank of Japan's commitment to um, fix the deflation will be important. And also the government debt is a problem. So here, the more spending is not probably the answer today. The stabilizing the government debt and show, the, show credibly that uh, Japanese government debt will not explode and there will be a fiscal consolidation in the future will be a good idea. So fixing a macroeconomic policy would help. But it's probably not enough. You know, what Japan has experienced is a low growth or stagnation for 15 years, 20 years. The usual business cycle and shortage of aggregate demand cannot explain that. So there is more structural problem that reduce the growth rate for Japan. And in order to stimulate the productivity growth for Japan, which is very important, especially important for Japan because Japan faces more rapid aging compared with uh, other countries. And one, uh, one way to um, stimulate the growth is to open up the economy for global competition. Okay. So joining TPP and uh, liberalizing trade will be a good idea. Okay. And we, know, we all know the classical gains from trade for the consumers, but there are some recent studies that shows by opening up uh, of the country for foreign competition actually motivates the domestic com com companies to increase the productivity growth uh, or, or the, uh, uh, improve the productivity in order to survive the competition uh, in the global market. So liberalizing trade actually helps on the productivity growth as well. Uh, reform agriculture is another thing which, which has a very low productivity uh, I have some interesting slides. So uh, if there is a Q&A session, if you ask question about agriculture, I can show you those slides. <laughs> um, one, way to, uh, one, one way to answer the challenge of uh, population decline or aging and population decline, which is happening in Japan, is to encourage immigration, okay. which hasn't happened in Japan yet. And I know little about, little about Australia, but I heard that there, there was an immigration reform and the policy, re, policy change in Australia 20, 30 years ago. And, um, and I don't think it was a very easy thing to do. And uh, I think there, there, there are some policy lessons Japan can learn probably from Australian experience in changing the immigration policy. And finally, the first set of policy option is regulatory reform. Okay. The reduces the regulation, the stop the protection of zombies, and uh, deregulation is especially important in non-manufacturing non industries. Okay. And uh, just me, l l let me just point out the one way, uh, one um, 
class of regulatory reform that the Japan can do quite easily without, uh, with, without spending much. Okay? And, and, and let me end there. Okay. So this is a table uh, coming from the World Bank report on cost of conducting businesses. The World Bank uh, publishes this every year. Okay? And the first column shows the uh, rank, the e ease of doing business ranking. And uh, this, the, the other column shows the ranking for some categories, which are aggregated to form the ease of doing business ranking. The first, the overall ranking, Japan is, I think, do, doing okay, not spectacular. Okay. Uh, Australia is doing better, uh, as you can see. Okay. Japan is not doing bad, but not doing particularly well. And if you look at the individual category, the place, one place where the Japan score is very low is the cost of starting up a business. Okay. And actually, this is where Australia scores very high, the second. Okay. I think first is Singapore in almost all of these categories. <laughs> so uh, why? the cost of a starting up a business is high for Japan. And if you look at the more details, the subcategories of a starting up a business, you can find like uh, it takes a time to register for the business. It, you have to visit a lot of uh, administration, administrative offices to get the permit and so on. So one way to reduce the cost of starting up a business is to create a one place where the new business can go and get a permit on everything they need. Okay. And that doesn't cost the government a lot. Actually, that can save the government because uh, they can uh, you know, close down some of the offices and uh, combine them to one place. Okay. And they may be able to uh, fight or reloc relocate the workers for some more important places. So there, there are uh, several things we suggest in, in the report, but there are lots of things the Japanese government can do um, without costing very much to help restore the growth for Japan. Okay. And only problem is if there is a political will to do that. Okay. So, so let me end here. <laughs>